Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is George Dimakopoulos. I'm the co-director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. Um, we will um, begin by asking His Eminence to lead us in a prayer. Almighty Lord, we thank you for being always with us, and we ask you to bless all of us uh, that we are gathered here to give us wisdom and to let us uh, continue our work in your field and to be always able to spread the good news of the resurrected Lord. We ask you also to keep all of us and we ask you to spread the peace in the whole world and especially in our homelands in the Middle East. We ask you this in the name of the resurrected Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. So one of, the, um, uh, one of the great additions to the Orthodox Christian Studies Center this year has been our first ever research fellow, um, Dr. Uh, Donna Rizik Azdurian, who's uh, been with us for this year. And I asked her, I said, okay, you're here for the year, you gotta put together a panel session for us. And so she has come up with this wonderful um, idea for a panel session about the intersection of uh, Oriental Orthodox Christianity and the academic life. Um, and so Donna is going to um, run our session this evening. And so I will turn it over to, to her now. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for traveling and coming and attending um, here with us this evening, um, especially post-Easter. I know sort of it's a busy time. Um, but we want to welcome um, everyone here. Our first um, Oriental Studies Seminar Day, and we're very excited to have three hierarchs from the three different traditions um, joining us. I just wanted to briefly introduce um, the vision of the Orthodox Christian Center and my experience here and um, how it links to the vision with our seminar tonight. Um, the, as George mentioned, that um, I am a research fellow for this year, and it was very exciting to be part of um, an Orthodox ethos that focuses on the development of Orthodox knowledge and awareness um, in public discourse, and especially in an academic setting. And what's unique about the Orthodox Christian Center that its um, ethos is not only about academic rigor or development, but also about um, ecumenism. And um, myself being sort of a witness to that, coming from the Coptic and Armenian traditions, it's very exciting to be part of such a wonderful group and faculty um, and students. So I welcome you here again, and I encourage you again to visit um, the Orthodox Christian Center page and um, follow Public Orthodoxy, and which has been growing extensively, which has, I think, several thousand followers, um, and sort of to be part of the discussion as you are here today. Um, and being present um, is, I think, one of uh, the main big steps to take part and to be sort of a witness of this ethos and this vision that the center shares um, with Penn Orthodoxy along with Fordham University. Um, so we are, as you saw um, the flyer, uh, we are speaking about the Church for Academia, bringing scholarship with academic life. Um, many cases in our environments, whether in the church life or in the academic setting, they sort of seem uh, two separate um, visions and ethos, which is fine. Um, but at the same time, over time, I, in my opinion and what I've observed, um, these sort of entities have become sort of um, separate and, and growing um, separately as time has come. And I wanted to sort of, as George was mentioning, we came up with this idea of bridging the gap between the church and the academia. And I think it's important for the benefit of both. While both have their um, respective visions and their missions and ethos, but at the same time, uh, one and both in each can benefit from the other. And so we're here tonight with three hierarchs, uh, respective of their traditions, who are also academic in their train, and they're theologically also visionary, um, to sort of lay out for us what is the future of academia in this um, perspective, as well as the church um, initiative with theological training and theological um, students and seminarians. 
um, particularly, and I, this is my personal stance, um, those outside of uh, the ordained priesthood, so like a woman, um, what is their function within the church life besides academia? And so these are some of um, the ideas that we came up with tonight. So sort of while um, the speakers are, will be presenting, we'll have a panel discussion afterwards for about 20 minutes. Um, if you can, keep your uh, questions to the end for the sake of time um, and sort of um, be cooking up some good questions that we could have a good discussion for this evening. Um, and so to no further ado, I will introduce our first speaker who um, actually has traveled all the way from France. So we thank you for your travels. Um, Bishop Vahan Hov Nassian, um, who is from the Armenian Orthodox Church. He currently is a primate of the Diocese of um, the Armenian Church in France. Um, so the initial flyer actually said Archbishop, so I unknowingly elevated his grace. Um, but anyways, um, so you know, we do what we can here. Um, he's a graduate from St. Nurse's Seminary and St. Uh, Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary. He pursued a doctorate um, in Biblical Studies at Fordham University right here at our campus. Um, he's served in the New York, New Jersey area, London as primate. That's when I met your grace for the first time, I think six years ago or so. Um, and now he serves as primate in France. So please welcome um, with me Bishop Vahan Hovhannes. Thanks, Donna. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. <clears throat> I'm honored to be back <clears throat> at this great institution, my alma mater. Uh, <clears throat> where I spent about eight years as a student and now as a guest speaker. I'm humbled to see amongst you my professor, Father Joseph Leinhard, an example to emulate. Uh, many, many nights I spent in this building trying to prepare for his exams. This used to be the library and you could not find a space because it was packed with students like me trying to study the last minute before the test. I'd like to thank the center, Orthodox Center for uh, studies uh, for Orthodox Christian studies, for the invitation, Dr. George, Dr. Donna, and all of you for coming here. Uh, <clears throat> to start with, I'd like to remind you my academic research at Fordham was in the New Testament. My research was in New Testament Apocrypha. Uh, so this is a field that uh, Academically, I'm not very uh, versed in it, but as a clergy in the Armenian Church for the past 30 years, uh, I can present my uh, observations as a person who was trained academically in the academic uh, circles, as a person who for 30 years has been trying to preach the gospel and witness to the Lord from the uh, pulpit of the churches. My focus will be on the Armenian Church, although it's the same thing with the uh, almost same thing with the Coptic Church, Syriac Church, so I look forward to hearing to my colleagues. I will also hint a few things about the church in the West when the experience is common. I'll start with a, a historical review of theology in the church versus academia, and conclude with four suggestions. Four of them I think are very difficult, but uh, I will suggest and let's see what happens. Throughout the early centuries of Christianity, research in the Bible and theology was exclusively an ecclesiastical exercise. The process of the interpretation and exegesis of the biblical text and that of theology and the advance of the mainstream church theology was developed in the major ecclesiastical centers with their theological schools such as Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. So theological research in the early centuries of Christianity was largely an in-house project, albeit a large, a broad house. In the Armenian church, academic research is the bone of the mission of the clergy. The fourth century historians narrate the conversion of Armenians to Christianity and the conversion of the king in the year 301 and how monks had to spend months and months learning Syriac and Greek. And the historians are amazing how they describe the details of it. It looks like a small university or academic institution where they were divided to groups. Some studied Syriac, others studied, uh, studied Greeks. They were uh, involved in the translation of the documents, then teaching the languages. 
In fact, in the year 401, when the time came to translate the Bible, we see a beautiful example of a scholarly, uh, kind of a model of a scholarly research to translate the document. There were two teams created. One was sent to Caesarea, the other one uh, was sent to Ephesus, and the two teams studied Syriac and, and Greek. Uh, they translated the Bible, what is known as the hastily translation, and then the translation went through a second verse where version where the translation was compared to manuscripts from Ephesus, and that gave birth to the official Armenian translation. Comparison, uh, manuscript uh, variations, and thus the birth of the Armenian translation. The appearance of heretical movements within the church stimulated further critical research within the church. These movements, such as the Gnostics, challenged the church's interpretation of the Bible, this is the first time in the history of the church that people outside the church examining the Bible and the tradition of the church challenge the church's orthodox interpretation and faith. These challenges force the church to look deeper into her early interpretations and prepare a critical answer to these challenges. For example, <clears throat> in the Armenian church, one of the most profound examples of biblical exegesis and commentary is found in a book titled Refutation of the Sects by Yeznik of Kolb, Yeznik Golbatsi. Every line, every statement in this book has a footnote in the Bible and is commentary on the biblical verse, and it's used to refute the teachings of the sects in Armenia. A beautiful example of responding to the heretics as a motivation to de dig deeper into the biblical text and theology. However, this phenomenon, one must state immediately, gradually started to disappear as Christianity became more and more comfortable in the lands where it spread. In the year 301, it became the religion of the kingdom of Armenia, and in the year 380 AD, it became the religion of the empire. As you know, with the Edict of Thessalonica, Emperor Theodosius I made Christianity the only exclusive religion of the empire, although the tolerance was earlier, time of Constant Emperor Constantine. The more Christianity became the official religion of the empire, the less these challenges were tolerated, and I believe the less the church had to dig deeper to prepare answers to these challenges. As you know, and I remember from my course, Paul Lindheim, in fact, the canon of the New Testament kind of was a reaction to Marcion. If there was no Marcion creating his own list of the Bible, the church may not have been forced to develop its own canon of the Bible. I have a, uh, 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 there you go, another example of uh, the church reacting to the heretics to develop its own theology. Then I go to the second stage, I go old assumptions. And here I believe where the actual divorce begins with, within the church and uh, academia. And to make it brief, it's basically the concept of the rule of faith. Uh, while heretics and external factors positively affected the process of the church theology, internal factors, I believe, began to have opposite effect, effects, impeding the progress of ecclesiastical pursuit of theology and imposing limitations on this process. Already, the concept of the rule of faith, meaning a standard for adherence to the faith of the universal church and the apostolic teaching, had been introduced. As a historical standard for ad uh, adherence to orthodoxy of the church, the rule of faith originally was an earlier and shorter version of the apostolic creed, but then it continues other documents, the Nicene Creed, uh, statements by St. Athanasius, and depending which denomination, it goes all the way to the Westminster Constitution. The challenge to the church theology started when the rule of faith, on parish level, on the preaching level, replaced the need for the study of the Bible. That is to say, the rule of faith became the standard definition of Christianity in many churches, especially in the West. Therefore, these churches focused on promoting and teaching the components of the rule of faith and its tradition, while reading and interpreting the Bible gradually became secondary. In some churches, it was even forbidden for the laity to read the Bible. 
The forces, the focus on the rule of faith made sense in those days for many practical reasons. The biblical text was not available in every household. In fact, up until its publication, the Armenian Bible version of the Bible was available only in manuscript forms, only in monasteries, churches, cathedrals, and royal palaces. Illiteracy, which dominated the majority of the agricultural society of the time of the first millennia, made it difficult for the average Armenian to read, translate, understand, or question the biblical text. In order to be able to conduct a serious theological research, memorizing creedal statements and prayers was sufficient to demonstrate the faith of the person for which the church did not feel compelled to pursue further research in the text of the Bible and theology on the parish level. Very simple. In fact, the church paintings and icons were used to educate the illiterate because they couldn't read. So you'll see beautiful icons describing different events in the Bible because people could not read. So they'll see the pictures and the icons and they remember these stories. Obviously, on that level of society, it's difficult to demand and expect serious academic research of the text of the Bible. Uh, this, by the way, was the same in the church uh, in the West as well. As late as the Baltimore Catechism of the 1853, which is the expansion of the Robert Bellarmine Small Catechism, catechism of the 1614, we read the following question. Must we ourselves seek in the scriptures and traditions for what we are to believe? And the answer says, we ourselves need not seek in the scriptures and traditions for what we are to believe. God has appointed the church to be our guide to salvation, and we must accept its teaching as our infallible rule of faith within the church. And it continues. A clear demonstration of the fact that on the parish level, on the level of catechism and converting people to the gospel, the church felt relaxed in the field of theological research. All it needed is few icons, few rules to teach the laity to make them qualified to become Christians. The situation discussed above led to the creation of certain principles and dogmas that were considered beyond examination in the church. Thus, a key difference that can be detected already between today's critical theology, of, uh, critical research of theology and that of the church is the assumption and acceptance by the church of certain theological principles as part of the rule of faith and earlier church traditions to be beyond investigation and research. The fact that God exists, a church theologian will not discuss. The fact that there's a trinity, a church theologian will not, it's beyond the limitation. A church theologian assumes that, starts with the trinity. The fact that God created the earth. So already we have a clear separation between a secular scholar, an atheist scholar, who would question all these limitations, and let's say an orthodox an Armenian scholar who says, don't no, we believe in God, God exists, we believe in Holy Trinity, let's go beyond that. My second section of the brief presentation is the beginning of the second millennium. And this is a sad page of the history of the Oriental Orthodox churches. It's a page filled with executions, genocides, torture, and destruction of churches. <clears throat> the domination of the church in the East and in Armenia by Islam, for centuries, starting as early as the 8th century, with, the cons with its consequences, which included the prohibition of evangelism and of public practice of Christianity, had its consequences on critical theology in the church. As early as the 9th century, the Armenian church found herself in a situation where she is not allowed to convert non-Christians to Christianity, 
No programs of catechism and evangelism were allowed to be published and distributed. The church was controlled by the state, which controlled every aspect of the church administration. This reduced the Armenian church basically to an ethnic society where Armenian families participated to worship using their ancestral liturgy and baptized their children. Needless to say, in such a state of preaching to the choir, no urgent need was felt for the church to pursue serious research of the biblical text or theology. The Ottoman Empire, using the Sharia law, designated Christian churches within the boundaries of her empire as civil representations of the ethnic minorities of non-Muslims that made up these churches. The, part, the patriarch or head of the church was appointed as the representative of this minority referred to as millet. So now the church is being overburdened with a mission or response which has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church and the patriarch becomes the judge, the prosecutors, and the executors of Armenians who live within the Roman Empire who violate the law of the land because they cannot be prosecuted by the Sharia. It's the duty of the patriarch and the church to pursue these uh, elements. This makes the church, the government, the police, the preserver of the ethnic identity of the church, the cultural center, the political center, the center of the resistance to begin a revolution against the Roman, uh, against the Ottomans, and all these factors, needless to say, will leave serious academic research of the Bible as the last point on the agenda of any bishop or patriarch. The Ottoman Empire, using the Sharia law, designated Christian churches within the boundaries of her empire as millet. The patriarch was forced to follow the system, prosecute and execute members of the church, not by the gospel of Jesus Christ, not based on the canons of the church, but based on the Sharia law, which the Ottomans imposed on her subject. Gradually, this external pressure, pressure tuned, turned the Armenian church and all the Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox churches within the uh, boundaries of the Ottoman Empire to depositories of historic faith and museums of old liturgical celebrations in ancient languages and offices collecting information to be ready for government agents whenever needed. Churches gradually turned into institutions of preserving the ethnic identity of the members of the church, which was emphasized against that of the other Christian minorities, Greeks or Syriacs, and the non-Christian majority in the country. The situation ultimately stopped the local church's pursuit of serious theological research and turned its focus inward. The focus of the church mission became preserving the doctrine and the rituals of the church that comes from generations past. Obviously, pursuit of serious theological research would have been the last item on the list. In the West, the situation was different a bit. While Islam challenged the eastern boundaries of Europe, the main pressure remained internal. The church in the West, unlike the East, was very influential in political affairs. Throughout the Middle Ages, clergy in many cases held real political power the church was sovereign over a number of territories in Italy known as the Papal States, which had their own armies. The Pope also exercised an important power called the Papal Deposing Power, which was the authority even to remove kings from their throne. Without delaying, delving into the uh, political and historical details, obviously for such reasons, you can realize the church has deviated from uh, uh, the pursuit of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and focus more on these worldly powers that it was vested with. This doesn't mean, by the way, every church throughout the whole Armenian uh, church or the Western church stopped preaching the gospel. It means there's a powerful external pressure that is forcing this church to focus on other things, on political matters, on financial matters, as opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The 19th century 
While this was going on in the West, the Armenian church was experiencing the beginning of a genocide. As early as 1800, the Ottoman Empire started organizing mass killing of minorities, especially Armenians and Syriacs and Greeks. This included the arrest of the male members of the society and villages, the deportation and violation of the female members, and enslavement of the children. Throughout the decades, the scale and span of the atrocities continued until 1915, when the government of the Young Turks executed the first genocide of the 20th century. In addition to all the churches mentioned above, the genocide targeted the monasteries, the convents, burning manuscripts, and churches, and destroying schools. In the main cities, seminaries, and monasteries that served for centuries as places to prepare future theologians and clergy were closed or converted for other usages and remain closed until today. Needless to say, again, theological research will be the last thought on the mind of a widow who saw her husband shot in front of her and who was forced to march hundreds of miles to be relocated in foreign lands. Thank God, however, within a few decades after the genocide, Armenians were able to build their churches in the land of immigration, be it the Middle East or Europe. And soon, a seminary was built to pursue theological research as much as a society can afford in those days. While this was happening in Western Armenia, Eastern Armenia became under the domination of the Soviet rule. Again, the church was forbidden to evangelize. Many seminaries and seminarians and churches were closed, destroyed, tortured, and deported. And one Catholicus actually was poisoned. Once again, we come face to face with a church that has been reduced to the ashes, to a shell <clears throat> that is not able to pursue the basics of her mission, let alone to pursue serious theological research. The European Enlightenment, a fundamental shift in the theological research was introduced with the European Enlightenment. After centuries of building and defining the European identity and culture, the church and Christianity, with their old assumptions, were challenged and became targets of investigations, not necessarily by believers, but even by those who wanted to challenge this assumption because they did not believe in them. Theological research was no longer reserved for ecclesiastical ecclesiastics, rather it became a popular target to investigate by lay academics to dis dissect and deconstruct anew. This can be explained based on certain historical facts. As a result of the above, or of the side effects of the Enlightenment, the phenomenon of secular theologian emerged and in greater numbers. While one can argue that a similar situation might have happened in the second and third century of Christianity, but this was the first time to produce an entire generation of scholars and theologians whose primary intellectual pursuit involved consciously deconstructing the apostolic faith. Obviously, these kind of thinkers would not seek professional occupation in the church, as their objective was to dismantle the church's foundation. As the academy in the West became the dominant center of intellectual life, a small minority of theologians in the Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox tradition, including Armenians, in an effort to aid their church, ironically, left the church and monasteries and themselves shifted increasingly from the churches to the acad academia. Within several decades, therefore, a clear division was created between academic theologians who did not believe in the foundations of the church theology and those clergy who actually wanted to keep the assumptions of the church faith. The dominant worldview in the wider academic community began, became increasingly hostile to the historic faith. 
In fact, soon Orthodox or Armenian or Christian theologians found themselves responding to an agenda set by secular liberal theologians. At this, stage, at this stage, the focus of Armenian and Orthodox academic theologians was to use academia to justify the historic faith. The mission of the Armenian church and theologians, therefore, in the 20th century became defensive and has largely remained so to this day. Uh, if I have a few more minutes, let me jump to conclusions. I have a few more pages, but I know I'm running late. So what can we do? Uh, the, the, there are clear differences and separations between academic theology and the church. The church theology assumes certain things. We don't want to go beyond that, that God exists, that God created, that the, the Holy Trinitarian theology, uh, secular or academic uh, circles go beyond that. They want to dissect all that. Uh, church theology limits its audience to believers or those who are interested in the church theology. Uh, secular th uh, uh, theologians assume the whole world is interested in reading their thick volumes about uh, something. Uh, <laughs> and, and there are very expensive books, by the way, that uh, people sell. Uh, <laughs> uh, another thing is the uh, fact that academia really sees itself as scholarship, where they dig, they see under every rock they want to think something, while theologians see themselves as synthesizers. They try to take these facts and create something that people can understand and can follow. How can we reconcile this gap between the two? I propose four things. Number one is the office of priesthood. Uh, I was uh, shocked when I did my Master's of Divinity degree. Then I said I want to go to doctorate. They said <laughs> MDiv is only for pastors. You can't do PhD with MDiv. I said, why? The two years of MDiv. They said MDiv is for only for preparing pastors. Do you see the church is preparing people who are not academically ready to be an average scholar, but why? That needs to change, I believe. A priest must be a scholar, must be a theologian. In those days, Athanasius, uh, John Chrysostom, uh, Basil the Great, they were the PhDs of the time. They weren't just uh, uh, average preachers and uh, uh, performers of sacraments. The second point I'd like to propose is the seminaries. In the seminary, I get very frustrated because there were those who, without knowing the ABC of the Bible, would start discussing uh, social liberation and, and uh, women ordination to the priesthood and divorce and all that, but they haven't read the second book of the Bible. They don't know what the Bible says. Father Paul Tarazi, my professor of Old Testament the seminary, said, if he becomes a patriarch of the Antiochian church, he would recommend that in the seminaries, the first two years they learn only Bible. And the third year, they can learn the other things, systematic theology and all that. The first two years, Bible. Because if you're going to be a priest, you need to know what the Bible is. You can't start discussing theology and, and all that without knowing what the Bible says. My fourth point, was, which may be a bit controversial, is what do we expect from our priests? That's another thing. I mean, what kind of uh, Christians are we producing? What is the catechism of today? Uh, I know in, uh, in the Armenian church, for example, when I was in New Jersey, there was a very nice man who was a benefactor of the church. But one day I said, Father Vahan, he said, uh, please uh, change this. We're tired of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Can you talk about the Armenian church history, about the genocide? I mean, okay, but enough church, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, and the gospel. So I said, Mr. X, but that's my job, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and the parables and the things. But do you see, the man was expecting a, a nice lecturer, maybe uh, about historic, cultural things. Uh, so the fourth question is really, what do we expect from the church? For some people, the church is only a place to perform the sacraments, hatch, match, and dispatch. For some people, the church is, the, especially in the churches of the Orient, Oriental Orthodox churches, Arabic, Syriac, Armenian, Coptic is the national element. Even the Greek church has the same thing. You know, the Greek church, you know, the Greek language. And they expect that, you know, you have to be very nationalistic in your sermons. So uh, the fourth question to bridge this gap is to prepare true disciples of Christ in the parishes. People who are proud to say, I am a man of the covenant with Jesus Christ. I've been baptized in the new covenant and teach me more about this covenant. That's what I need from the church and not politics and culture and histories. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sir Pazan, um, for that very enriching lecture and sort of walking us through the Armenian history in light of academia and theological training and the stance of the church today. Um, it's very interesting. Um, and we see sort of, you'll see sort of parallels that the Armenian church is faced with the Syriac and the Coptic church of persecution um, and academia and theological training. Um, I would um, like to um, introduce our next speaker, um, Archbishop John Kawak of the Syriac Orthodox Church, um, who is the patriarchal vicar of the um, Syriac Orthodox Church for the Eastern United States. Um, they just um, finished the center and the cathedral in Paramus, New Jersey. I encourage you all to visit. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, center um, and a beautiful community um, in Jersey, and of course, all over. Um, uh, Archbishop John Kowak holds a BA in Theological Studies from St. Ephraim Syriac Theological Seminary from Syria, an MA in Eastern and Oriental Liturgy from the Pontifical Institute in Rome, and he was also the Professor of Liturgy and Liturgical Theology um, in Syria for about 10 years. Um, and then he uh, came to the United States, and we're uh, very blessed and honored to have him with us. Um, so please welcome Archbishop John Kowak. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone here at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University for inviting me to speak on the subject, the Church for Academia, meeting scholarship with ecclesiastical living on Oriental Orthodox Studies seminar today. Thank you very much. Life lessons are often learned in classrooms. However, ask yourself this question. Is the classroom the only place where learning occurs? If your answer is no, then you just might be on the right track. Hands on experience is the most tangible way learning happens. And it happens every day while you are doing something as simple as breathing. In class, you may learn about something that uh, piques your interest. However, it is not only true real until experience comes into the picture. The church, the guiding hand that walks, walks you through that reality, the experience. The Syriac Orthodox Church is based on Christian principles that date back to the time when Jesus walked on earth. It is through a myriad of emotions filled with light and darkness that we have learned. It is through the Christian principle that we have learned to survive and uh, persevere. This is how the world, the learning and the hands on experience come together for us. We hurt and we heal, we come together as one. As a leader of uh, the Syriac Orthodox Church, I, served, I serve our God, but also our people in the name of God. Studying theology to me meant that I would become closer to God, but is that what God would just want from me? I asked myself. Clearly, the lessons are to be shared with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm here to guide them and bring them with me to live in the glory of our Lord. I may have learned much in the classroom, but it is when I am applying what I have learned to real life experiences, to speaking to a mother whose child has passed away or to a newly married couple that I, I am living what I have learned. In the Syriac tradition, history, as all the Oriental churches, history is a part of the fabric of uh, our lives. Our schools are many and considered ancient, dating back to as early as the third century. A few examples of these are the school of Edessa, which became very popular in 363 AD 
through the care of uh, St. Ephraim. In 489 AD, after being open for 126 years, it was closed down. Then there was the school of Nisibis, which was opened in the fourth century until the seventh century. The most famous student and teacher were uh, there was uh, St. Jacob of uh, Nisibis, Narsai, and Babai the Great also taught there. Our third widely known school is the school of Qunishreen, which means the eagle's nest. It stood on the right of the bank of the Euphrates. It was established around 530. This was the greatest school of theology and science at the time after the beginning of the ninth century and continued to stand until the 13th century. Dating back to the early modern period, Patriarch Jacob II, 1847, 1871, visited Istanbul for business with the Sultan and was told by the Armenian Patriarch that each nation or Milla needed schools. Seeing as how this was a matter of great importance, immediately after, modern schools began to be established next to the churches in the second half of the 1800. After the devastation left by Saifo, as some of you may know as the Syrian and Armenian and Greek genocide, dating back to 1914 until 1920, Patriarch Ephraim I established St. Ephraim Theological Seminary in 1939 in Zahli, Lebanon. This is the official seminary of uh, the church, although it is not at a university level. Due to the need of a university, Patriarch Zakka I, who passed uh, away recently, began a project to establish a, uni a university in Syria which is in progress as of right now. The current patriarch, Ephraim II, who was a student here at uh, Ford University, but he didn't finish his uh, PhD because, uh, because he was elected as patriarch. So being patriarch, it's uh, much more important uh, than having a PhD. So the current patriarch, Ephraim II, set the opening date of the first university for September 2018, this year. Regarding theological studies, we are sending our students uh, to study in uh, European and American universities after finishing their theological diplomas at Moraframe Theological Seminary in uh, Damascus. As you see, <clears throat> our Syriac Orthodox Church and educational system are very much tied together. Our people matter very much, and our church is working and trying to work very hard to pave the way for the future. In order for the academia and the church to be able to engage with one another more effectively, they must both realize that they are not that different at all. Their goals are to teach and engage those who are willing. Scholars can help the church to create resources that provides spiritual support. For now, and I'm giving you some experience from our uh, uh, academics uh, on the field. For now, our Syriac scholars are translating for us the Peshitta, our official version of the Bible, into English. So we can use it in the church. One of our deacons finished a hymnology book, but a Syriac scholar who is also a native English speaker, edited the translations to ensure their positions in English. How could the average church goer, goer and celebrant get their hands on the most important of academia writing? Well, for starters, ask yourselves if you leading a busy life always have time to do extra research on personal matters? If your answer is no, 
then perhaps you might want that information provided to you in a faster and easier format. Scholars must be encouraged to take their books and articles and write them in a simple manner for people to understand. In case of Syriac studies, we have a good example of just that, as Sebastian Brock keeps the normal reader in mind when he writes. He is the foremost academic in the field of Syriac studies today. Seeing as how this work, the church must be open to using and adapting this text while working hand in hand with scholars. Due to the current uh, war or situation in Syria, the church is now torn and does not have a policy or vision in place for leading those members of academia. However, the church should give the time to be a part of this discussion in the future. The church should make it a policy to integrate Syriac faithful who are also part of the academia and to ask academics who are also part of the church to be its academic resource. At the moment, we have, uh, not too far from here, we have uh, Beth Mardutho in New Jersey with connections uh, at Princeton and Rutgers. We also have uh, Beto Surio in Salzburg University in Austria and St. Ignatius University in Sweden, Södertälje. We need to approach them to be active in the church. A meeting already took place this year to coordinate these organizations with each other. Currently, there is no structure or system set in place for non-ordained leaders. It would serve us well to have this set in place as it is important for our survival in the diaspora. I believe we need to place more of a focus on the role of women, and I know Donna will be so happy to hear uh, my proposal here. I believe we need to place more of a focus on the role of women in the diaspora church in the 21st century non-ordained academics can help with theological dialogues. In order for our church to establish a set structure for non-ordained leaders, we would have to instill a change in mentality within the church. I believe part of the reason this change has not occurred is that many of our lay people are not academics in the theological field. Our current theological academics are mostly ordained deacons, priests, or monks. For the church to prepare for church academics, it must understand what academics bring to the table. We must encourage our faithful to pursue academic studies that can help the church and others, but this is not an easy task as careers in the field of theological academics are not easy to attain. Our church must work with what we have now. We have a few academics, and I'm talking mostly about the Syriac church. We have a few academics in our presence, but we are not utilizing them as we should. This can be the first step of uh, that new beginning. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Also, I'd like uh, to extend a thank you once again to Fordham University for providing me an opportunity to speak on this subject. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sedna, um, for that very enlightening talk. Um, and for also highlighting all the different theological schools um, here in the West. Um, I wasn't aware of actually half of them. Um, so thank you for sharing that and mentioning the role of women. It's always good to hear. Um, so uh, to no further ado, uh, I will introduce our uh, final speaker who has come from 
California. I have dragged him out of his schedule, um, whom I've known for about 20 years, and we went to seminary together. Um, bishop Corollas of the Coptic Orthodox Church is um, the Bishop of Education in Southern California, um, the Diocese of California and Hawaii. He is the first American-born bishop in history who was ordained to the Episcopacy in 2016. He also has established ACTS, a theological school in California, and which is headed towards uh, U.S. accreditation and is also the dean of that school. Bishop Corollas um, obtained his MTS and THM from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology and then pursued his doctorate in patristics um, from the University of Notre Dame, focusing on uh, the writings of St. Cyril of Alexandria. Um, please welcome Bishop Corollas of the Coptic Church. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, and I must first uh, extend an apology for my tardiness. Um, many years ago, I, I asked, why are the bishops always late? And uh, within a few months, I think I learned why I left uh, the Abbey at 3 in the morning. And I was trying to um, reschedule with Donna, but because of their eminences, um, I did what was uh, possible to, to make it on time. Uh, so I'd like also to extend my thanks uh, with those before me uh, to Fordham University and for Donna and others who have organized this unique and valuable seminar for Oriental Orthodox Studies. Directed on the subject of scholarship and ecclesiastical living, it's truly a special blessing for me to be here. And when I started uh, this uh, theological pursuit many years ago, I would have never expected to be speaking uh, today on such an important subject. Uh, for Oriental Orthodox Bishop Theologians. Uh, so it's worth much time for me uh, to be uh, with you this evening. I feel privileged also to hear, and I wish I had heard more uh, from my fathers on this subject that has been near and dear to my heart for many years. Before addressing the modern challenges, I think it is useful to provide a bit of historical background uh, to the theological studies uh, of the Orthodox Church, um, known as the Coptic Orthodox Church or the Ancient School of Alexandria, which is known as the Harvard or Oxford, uh, uh, today's Oxford, for theological teaching in the ancient world, not only for the Church of Alexandria, but also for students and hierarchs from all over the East and West who traveled, especially to Alexandria, for this purpose, inclu including Basil of Caesarea and others. The great Alexandrian fathers were and remain emblems of teaching and theological exposition from Origen, the first biblical exegete and scholar, Clement of Alexandria, Didymus the Blind, Athanasius the Great, Theophilus, Cyril I. But after the time of Cyril I and his departure in 444, the famous school does no longer seems to be referenced or even existing, perhaps because by that time it was him who had become the center for theological teaching by the fifth century. The school is almost non-existent in the seventh century with the Arab conquest and very little theological study is found until the 11th century when first theological and apologetic writings started to emerge in Arabic by Ibn al-Asal, Pope Gabriel II, Ibn al-Sabah, and Ibn al-Kabr. Uh, darkness returned again from the 15th century for several centuries until the light of theological teaching dawns with the establishment of Theological Seminary in 1893 with Archdeacon Habib Girgis. At this point, um, I could de delineate at least three tracks. The first one is a group of passionate cops who pursued doctoral studies abroad in esteemed institutions such as Princeton, Oxford, Thessaloniki, and Germany under the direction and encouragement of the late Pope Krolos VI. Some of these returned, spearhead a patristic center in Egypt, and translated patristic texts into Arabic, and educated leaders in the Coptic Orthodox Church. A second group was centered in the wilderness of Shahith and established their own unofficial school which combined asceticism with scholarly devotion, not without challenge or criticism. A third continued with the theological seminary in Cairo under the leadership of His Holiness Pope Shenouda III of blessed memory, who was the first bishop of education and later uh, was the 117th successor 
who established dozens of seminaries in Egypt, Australia, Austria, England, America, Canada, France, Germany, and elsewhere. <clears throat> Today, there are over 100 cops, globally men and women lay and ordained, who have and are pursuing higher education in theological studies. Many are teaching in higher institutions in America, Canada, Australia, Germany, England, and France, and centers for Orthodox study, particularly on Coptic studies and Coptic theology, can be found in the institutions of Melbourne, Sydney, and Los Angeles, of which I have the, the honor of serving in St. Athanasius and St. Cyril Theological School. In dealing with the subject of today, the Church for Academia, I think it is fair to say that in the golden era of the Church, before any divisions that resulted from Chalcedon or the Great Schism, there was a real division between theology and there was no real division between uh, theology and academia per se as we understand today. Instead, there was a tension within the person to follow a more academic approach to one's relationship with God, as Origen directed in his letter to Gregory, who advised him to adopt parts of the Greek philosophy which were fitting and proper as his preparatory studies for Christianity. In similar ways, the Cappadocians studied in Athens and other schools various subjects and languages before undertaking any systematic exploration of theology. Yet there were few institutions that could be related to today's theological schools that generated scholars with doctoral degrees. Today, even scholars debate whether there was the School of Alexandria as an institution, as we understand uh, something like this prestigious university. Yet they do agree that there were spiritual masters, such as Pentinus, Origen, Didymus, who were not only deans, but actually for the most part, the School of Alexandria during their lifetime. The modern tension we face has much to do with the scholastic movement in Europe from about 1100 to 1700. This is precisely when the school left the monasteries in East and West and moved towards the European universities. This is what I guess could describe some tension between Augustinians and Thomites and in some areas between East and West. So the concerns of today's discussion uh, is more or less a more modern problem primarily in a Western context. So when studying uh, an ancient theology in a Western context, which now we are also a answering the same questions. For this system took years to reconcile the various tensions between theologians and philosophers and academics with the monastics and systematic theology with mystical theology. It was not until this time also that we discovered professional theologians or academics as a career in professing, writing, debating important theological issues. Centuries later, there were positions, as with Origen and Clement, but at this time, at least in Alexandria, it seemed more service-oriented in Alexandria as opposed to a scholastic, more scholastic movements that took place much later. Before proceeding further, I'd like to share with you a couple anecdotes from my own personal journey, which could draw some lessons uh, that would apply to this modern question, and also would help you understand where we're coming from as uh, cops uh, in this theological journey. I think it could reflect the current process of how to become a theologian and may help us answer some of these critical questions. The first took place many years ago uh, before I had graduated from college. I toyed with the idea of applying to an Orthodox seminary and I got the applications for St. Vladimir's and from Holy Cross uh, in Boston. And these seemed to appeal to me to how to continue to be a better servant and more diligent in understanding the Bible and, and the history of our great tradition. Especially since at that time there were no formal classes for servants or preparation um, and didn't have the best experience in taking classes with our own theological seminary, which had been existent for some time but needed much work. When going to the application, I, both applications, I stumbled across the section which required a bishop recommendation. This posed two problems for me. First of all, uh, I just wanted to seek more information and to learn more about a deeper theological study. 
I had no interest in uh, being ordained to the ministry or in pursuing that route. Uh, so it, it didn't, it didn't re resonate with uh, my thoughts at that time. The second, probably more important, was that we had no bishop at the time, and it would be very difficult to contact the Pope to uh, approve of <laughs> this uh, journey. So I decided to, to make the more reasonable option uh, in pursuing theological study, and that was to go to law school. Uh, <laughs> and after that, the second reasonable step was to go to the monastery and become a monk. It turned out that uh, in God's plan, 10 years later after that, I would go to Holy Cross, and 11 years after that, I would become a monk. The, that's another story. But um, several years later, when I would submit my application to, to Holy Cross, it was actually turned out to be, for me, a plan B. Before that, the original plan was to study canon law at the Pontifical Inst Orientale Inst Institute in Rome. Uh, with the legal background that I had gained, this would be very logical. Um, and uh, also with, uh, with the encouragement of Cardinal Koch and others, um, everything seemed to be set in order. All I had to do was get the approval and blessing of His Holiness Pope Shenouda. Um, Little did I know that after a short time, uh, I was directed into, instead of uh, studying canon law, I would study patristics, and instead of studying uh, with the Catholics, I would study with the Greeks. Um, I, at this time, became um, very well aware that the, the journey was much broader and much bigger than I had thought. While, while cops have had hundreds of canons over the years, like many Christians, canon law does not function in the most ideal way in the Coptic Church. And I was told that it would be not the best use of my time and energy, and with the wisdom of His Holiness, the Church needed to discover its patristic heritage, especially for its youth abroad and in the, con in the congregation here in the English language. Um, instead of being upset, I was somewhat relieved and excited at this notion. And within weeks, I was directed by uh, His Eminence Metropolitan Serapion and Father George Dragas of Holy Cross, and I was quickly enrolled in the school and, and Donna soon followed. I mention this only to draw attention to a few lessons uh, which I learned from these experiences. The first is the need for official established lines of communication between academia and the church. While I was making my decision to study the first time around, there was no established line of communication between academia and the church except for His Holiness and my bishop. It was tremendously helpful for me to have direction and responsibility taken by His Holiness. Uh, my own bishop was extremely involved in every stage of the process, and I would make regular reports during vi my visits throughout my studies, asking questions, engaging in fruitful discussions uh, through these long years. And in many ways, uh, our church has grown, yet the fatherly guidance and supervision is critical for theological study, not simply to monitor or supervise, but in a discipleship that is always important when doing theology. My professors certainly guided me along the way, I cannot doubt. Um, they introduced me to many things, but it, it were those fathers within my church that helped me apply that uh, theological teaching and study to the church in which I lived and served. Um, it's Sadly, this is not only rare in the Oriental Orthodox churches, but also in theological study in general. It's much easier in a seminary where Catholics study with Catholics and Greeks study with Greeks, but when we are in different traditions, it's, this dialogue is of utmost importance because uh, for other reasons, you're perceived in many different ways when you go to study in a different university. Um, and so the, also the, the, how essential it is is the assimilation or incorporation of concepts and notions in one's own tradition because it's precisely for this reason that we have had many growing pains, conflicts between theologians and clergy, 
ministry scholars and hierarchs. This may seem like a small thing, but it is not uh, very easy to apply. Uh, when uh, such leaders of the church are involved before someone studies, it, in such a way that there is a place for some direction, some dialogue, some discussion, it makes later discussions much more fruitful and easier to take place. Um, had I not uh, ha went to take the blessing of His Holiness, I would have been studying in a completely different field, doing completely different work, which I found my, my passion and my desire in a completely different field. Now, I don't know if anyone, everyone will have that experience, but it is common, just as a college uh, student at a university will change their major a few times. I think also in theological study, uh, we often do find our way in other fields where initially was not our plan. Um, because simply we don't just need approval or sanction, but involvement, responsibility, and pastoral care. And there's a great difference between the two. The first asks to sign a writ or mandate of acceptance, but the second asks for prayers, guidance, blessing, which is an invaluable relationship for the duration of one's, one's academic career and spiritual life. Everyone has the right and opportunity to seek a career in academia, but simply because one is Coptic, Syriac, Greek, or Armenian does not necessarily qualify them to be the reference for their own church on that subject or issue within the church's perspective. And that is an assumption many times given by those who go and study whatever they wish. It is those who are involved in the very beginning with the church in this dialogue that have very fruitful and very productive and efficient outcomes. And I know it may be sensitive for some of you, I'm only just reflecting on my own experience. And as academics, you are very well aware that there are several sides to the same issue, that same issue that require prayer, reflection, talent, and grace for the church to legitimate or sponsor any uh, notion or theologian. It's a process which requires thought and attention. The second is to inspire, engage, and communicate with future scholars. Since I began my studies, I noticed a consistent and exponential interest in theological studies in a broad sense, not only in our diocese, but throughout the world, from Australia to Egypt and all across the lands of immigration. Each is at a different level, I would say, in their interest, but it's what convinced us to move much more quicker than we originally planned, because many of those who were interested sought various solutions to their interests that were not always the best plan for their own life. It was sometimes very random or haphazard, and they would have different types of experiences in their own journey. The third is relieving the tension. Uh, this tension requires some work on both sides. I often hear that there's descriptions of how uh, the church fights against academics, sometimes in a ruthless or unjust way, and other times that uh, the hierarchs can be, um, or leaders of the church, um, sometimes accused of being ignorant or stubborn on one side uh, of the clergy, especially if they're accused of being wrong, inaccurate, or even ignorant of certain theological concepts. This is a part of those growing pains of humbly and honestly listening to experts in the field of study, in history, biblical studies, and liturgical studies. At the same time, however, students and professors of theology need to be acutely aware of when and how they present certain issues or findings to those leaders of the church especially as children of the church with discernment and in understanding the history of this issue in the broader concept of the church, which is a difficult thing to know and to be aware of. I've seen many bright, knowledgeable, and distinguished scholars make the same mistake time and time again and struggling with why our findings, our discovery, our research was not accepted by the church. Origen was a victim of his own brilliance, not because he didn't understand what he was saying, but because in many ways he made mistakes with the hierarchy that could, in my opinion, could have been solved. There are many issues <laughs> relating to Origen, which I will not uh, get into at this time. But the second point which I would like to mention is that we are in desperate need of developing a platform, one also for study of the clergy, as His Eminence mentioned. 
it becomes abundantly clear to me, at least in our first stage of theological studies, that uh, in this movement, we need as many clergy to be studying as possible. The obvious disadvantage in our church is the time that clergy simply don't have to give to education or advanced education because of the pastoral duties are simply overwhelming, especially, I know, in our Coptic church, there's very little time uh, to breathe. But without this necessary step, clergy will not be able to fully welcome new theologians into the church unless they have a similar experience, uh, as there will be many suspicions, fears, and perceived threats for any healthy dialogue and involvement. By no means am I saying that only clergy should study. It has become abundantly clear that their involvement will always, uh, in some sense, be minimal or less than those uh, theologians. Uh, Catholics have benefited by many orders who have theology at the center of their formation, whether Jesuits or Dominicans, and it seems uh, uh, backward that the main way to have more non-ordained leaders, including women involved in, in theological roles, is to have more ordained clergy leaders as well who are pursuing the same so that they can have similar and healthy dialogue. The third in dealing with theological institutions. As Habib Girgis noted in 1912, the theological school required, quote, careful consideration more than any other, since upon it lays the future religious education among individuals of community. In our opinion, the relationship of this school to the community can be compared to the relationship of the heart to the body. For as the duty of the heart is to pump blood to the organs of the body accordingly, from this spring, the spirit of teaching, guidance, and transmission of good news of salvation among people will spread among people. The community has no greater need than to take care and be concerned for the good of the school, upon which stands the future of the church, its advancement and development. This is in order for her to fulfill her holy vocation, which is to produce capable men who are able, and women, I should add, who are able to acquire honorable clerical vocations and work out the raising of signposts of faith as well as strengthening the position and dignity of, this, of the clergy, leading the flock to spread righteousness and virtue and to walk with them in the path of eternal life." Unquote. <clears throat> More than a century later, I find often repeating his words in establishing the growth of our theological institution. In fact, the primary reason why I was sent several years ago to study was to help our theological seminary solve many of the challenges it was facing since its establishment in 1989. We're grateful to the many institutions like this one, which encourages sponsors, and support students of Orthodox faith to study their history and theology in a fruitful academic environment. Such places are few and hard to find. I also had wonderful experiences at Holy Cross in Notre Dame, but many students of theology did not have the same fortune. That's why we spend many hours, as I said, counseling and directing uh, whoever uh, I can um, for those students who are in the early stages of their spiritual formation. This brings me to a next point which involves the challenges to pressure, to persevere, I'm sorry, uniqueness and identity. A few years ago when we were uh, first establishing our school, I was, uh, and re-establishing our school, I had a very co wonderful conversation with Father John Baer at St. Vladimir's, who was the dean at the time, to explore ways of mutual cooperation and collaboration. So he asked me very simply, if we were to do a program for COPS yeah, here, a uh, house of studies, how many courses would you need? So my initial thought was, we'd need one or two. We'd need probably liturgical studies, because our liturgy is very different, and we'd probably need something in modern uh, history, because it's very unique to COPS. Uh, within the same conversation, I said, well, we might also benefit from an early history uh, course as well, because it's not always emphasized uh, Alexandria within the broader context of the church. And after some more thought, I said, well, also dogmatics and the history of Chalcedon and the later development of Oriental uh, Christians. And then <laughs> within, by the end of the conversation, it became clear, more clear to me that, that it, we needed an entire program 
um, or one that would be very equivalent, even when it comes to biblical studies. I mean, how many times are uh, Coptic theologians, Armenian theologians, Syriac theologians quoted or cited or referred to in any school, in any place that's, that's outside of the Orient? You, you just won't find it, and they're not, not only won't discover it, there won't even many times be a thought or reflection because most of them are not in uh, modern languages, unfortunately, or referred to in the, the textbooks. Each of our relatively new theological institutions decided to partner with existing institutions in the, in the very beginning, including Melbourne College of Divinity, Sydney College of Divinity, the University of Toronto, and for our theological school, Claremont School of Theology, and Claremont Graduate University. The primary benefits of an academic environment, ecumenical dialogue, and ties and extensive libraries, among others, came also with a cost, and that is to maintain its identity, its financial security, and the number or quality of courses that we could provide within a track uh, or a concentration within a larger uh, program. And although um, I, We've, I've, I've thought on many occasions to preserve uh, the uniqueness of what we have as Oriental Christians, and I believe there's a longer and more difficult approach uh, has uh, more potential for, to be productive and, and to provide a more stable model in the future. We also face challenges of administration and systematization. I've been often jealous of the administrative structures in the Western schools. I don't think I have to tell you that structure is not a forte in the Orthodox churches in general or in theological institutions in particular. We tend to be a little bit more organic, at least to begin with, and in general are not always the best administrators, at least from what I have found in Egypt and Greece and Russia and other places. But uh, I do have to admit the Armenians are exceptional in this, and uh, they, they, take, they take a lead, at least from what I have experienced. At the same time, we Orthodox are very quick learners, especially when we have been raised in hostile environments, which oppresses education. We know how to adapt, to persevere, and to organize flexibly. For such environments naturally resist over-systematizations. At the same time, in an environment such as this one, Systems and procedures are essential for the lifeblood of any successful organization. And in my relatively short experience, I found that organic systems are extremely influential in establishing uh, the earliest phases, missionary projects, pastoral care, but directives to clergy or Sunday school servants and organizational charge are just not um, the way to go. It doesn't work. Instead, we need more mentoring and disciplining of our youth. With that said, I've also found that establishing positions for theologians is much easier and effective within a school setting with all of the appropriate uh, strategic planning, organizational charts, etc., than it is within a diocese setting. Um, so in, in our diocese, as Donna mentioned, I have two responsibilities, not only the dean of the school, but also the head of the Department of Christian Education. And I've intentionally delayed in pursuing the latter so that the first one may be clear because to establish an academic institution needs a very different structure than uh, the uh, Department of Christian Education. At least in our diocese, working in a separate theological institution provides the necessary latitude and freedom for academics and administrators to get a functioning system in place. Once you enter into a church setting, it becomes much more complicated uh, to operate effectively. There is a difference between grassroots movement and a trickle-down approach. For success in this venture of theological schools, we need both to be interested and involved at all levels. 
these two have to be coordinated as best as possible because if the school proceeds at a faster pace than the interests of the congregation, there will be a serious challenges, whether it be financial, getting enough students to enroll, or the support of its clergy. And if the school is not fast enough to meet the demands of the, the church, it's also drastically affected, not just in its current state, but also for years to come. Uh, I'll turn just to the, I think I have one minute. Um, <laughs> I had planned to speak a little bit more about publications, um, but I, uh, for the sake of time, uh, will just jump ahead to some concluding notes. Um, that in order to provide um, the theological teaching in a, as a long-term process to understand the future of our youth, we have to begin very young. And so I know um, in other churches are experienced with this, but we have been experimenting over the years into uh, deepening not only the Sunday school, but also summer activities and uh, events for elementary, junior high, and high school so that we have a plan to uh, encourage and to direct uh, its most brightest uh, students uh, into deeper theological study. And that is the sense where uh, theological study becomes as much as a calling as it is vocation and a service as much as it a career. Uh, I thank you again for your time and for your patience and look forward also to hearing from you and from my fathers so that we can all grow uh, in the knowledge of Christ and deepen our understanding in this time we have here together. Thank you. So um, thank you, Sayedna, for that um, enlightening talk. I'm going to ask, we have about 10, 15 minutes about. I'm going to ask the three speakers um, if you could join me here at the table. And we're going to um, have a brief panel discussion. So we're going to have the mic available. Um, so if you have any questions to ask any of the speakers, you're welcome to now. Um, I will begin. Um, and it could be directed to any of the hierarchs or um, to all three of them. Um, just for the sake of time, just um, shorten the question as much as you can and sort of um, for tonight. My, I'll, I'll begin the discussion. My first question, and this is addressed to any of um, the three hierarchs. Um, we spoke a lot about the um, church history and the sort of the context of each tradition um, and what the church experienced in light of persecution, theological training in academia. Um, I ask if you, in our current state, how would the church um, in your own respective traditions integrate um, theologically trained um, lay people uh, in the life of the church um, outside of sort of career, particularly for the lay, um, outside of priesthood as well? And what are sort of the methods we could take um, today? The incorporation of the laity in the mission of, mission of the church? Yeah. Academics, yeah. Academic? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think any of the Oriental Orthodox churches prevent any uh, layperson to be uh, a faculty member of any of the seminaries. Yeah. I know St. Nurses Seminary has always had uh, lay professors and even women professors who have been uh, leaders in the faculty. Um, even on a liturgical level, the canons of the church in the Armenian church allow for readers to be women, um, chanters of the psalms to be women. Uh, so uh, even liturgically speaking, we uh, have that thing for uh, women or lay people to pursue scholarship of liturgical uh, theology or and as I said, uh, as far as uh, academia, there's not a single limitation on lay people being involved in the seminary to, uh, to teach any of the subjects. So. If you allow me, we have a few uh, examples, especially in, uh, in Europe, but 
this is due to our integration with uh, other uh, institution, not because of us, because, you know, as I mentioned during my uh, presentation today, it's not easy to find a career when you are uh, uh, immersed in this uh, uh, field of theological study. But uh, as uh, uh, Surpazan mentioned, we, uh, we have in the liturgical uh, functions, we have certain role for uh, lay people. We have many deacons and they are uh, lay, not full deacons, mm -hmm. as readers. And also, I know you like to hear it from me, also women, they, they are part of the choirs and certain activities. And in Syria and in the Middle East, we used to have, not today because today, and I really would like to ask you to pray for uh, Syria because we don't know if today or tomorrow they will uh, uh, try to target it and send missiles. I hope not. But uh, before the, the, the war, we used to have uh, uh, courses for lay people during uh, summertime. Uh, and we used to have uh, uh, Dr. Maurice Tadros, and uh, mm -hmm. we have a, a nice collaboration with the, the Coptic Church to teach our lay people how to be um, uh, integrated into the catechism of the church. Of course, we don't pay them, they are volunteers, but uh, they are somehow trying to study theology and uh, do uh, their duty as volunteers in teaching our kids and, and youth. Thank you. The only thing that I would, I would add to that, whether it be the Sunday school or mentoring, um, also publications and translations, which we are in need of uh, continually, um, because there's, not, there's very few resources uh, in the Coptic Church, especially at a high academic level. Um, also, we are, we are um, exploring the idea of having uh, more direct advisors to the Holy Synod of uh, bishops um, on theological matters. I, mean, I say exploring because I don't know if we will be successful in the first time around, <laughs> uh, but, but we're working on it because there are, there are areas, if, if we can be successful in this, I think the whole church would benefit, but we really haven't had anything like it uh, historically as, as, as far as I'm aware. I'd like to thank all of you for this. This has been really wonderful. I, I, my question is really one about new world, old world, right? So as each of uh, the communities for which you're a part of exist within a diaspora, right? And uh, your, your people in your communities are, re, are going on and receiving elite educations at the Oxfords, at the Harvards, right, uh, wh wherever. And they're going on and they're receiving their PhDs and they, they're becoming um, experts in their own right. I'm wondering how um, those in Egypt, in Armenia, in Syria view these right, people born on foreign soil in the West with Western educations, you know, what, what how, what is that engagement there? How, how are they being viewed um, at home, so to speak? Are, are, they, are your communities taking as much advantage of them and using them as profitably as you think they should be? Or, or perhaps there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Uh, at least I, I can speak for myself. I know that uh, uh, cops in general love foreigners. <laughs> and so initially, <laughs> they're very welcoming and engaging. When it comes to the clergy, it gets a little bit different. I can speak from my own experience, because sometimes they are looked at like second class if they don't speak the language very well, or if they can't understand. So even sometimes in a sermon, or in, it, it, there is a little bit of gap there. Um, I think I had the benefit of both in, in the Siddhat. In, in uh, someone was just asking me today. So in terms of commu communicating, the, we have sometimes a language barrier, but, but I think it's gonna take some time to work on it, and as, if, we're, if we continue to be productive, I think, and, and to serve the church, 
then that speaks volumes. I mean, we can overcome the cultural, the linguistic barriers uh, given some time, but it is a, it is a, a, a challenge. I think that friction exists when it comes to uh, diaspora scholars majoring in uh, the Armenian culture or the language or history or when they come back. So they're looked upon as, you know, unless you're born there and raised there and you know, you know. But when it comes to theology and religion, at least in the Armenian church, because uh, Armenia for uh, over a century almost was under the Soviet rule, uh, Armenians in Armenia know they don't know the theology of the Armenian church. They looked forward, they, they welcomed the diaspora Armenian scholars to go back and teach uh, because they knew uh, if there's any friction, maybe it's starting now, now that you have uh, almost uh, a generation after the independence of Armenia and we have Armenians who had the opportunity to, uh, those who are born in Armenia for uh, generations, who, has the, who have the opportunity to go out and study, these people may see themselves as a bit more superior or more real Armenian scholars than uh, those from diaspora. I mean, I say when it comes to theology and uh, religious studies, uh, at least in Armenia we have no problem because that's a field that during the Soviet era was not pursued and there's no history, there's no uh, 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 you know, professors, you know, names that, uh, if anything, in the late uh, 1800 scholars went and studied in Germany, including archivendrites and priests. They came back, they were executed by the Soviets, so they did not have a chance to witness and teach. So I don't see, I see that problem in other fields, language, literature, uh, history. Uh, ultimately, you have to seek the blessing of a senior professor in Armenia for your research to be approved. But the other field, the field of history, uh, church, theology, biblical studies, uh, Armenians welcome from the diaspora. They're eager to learn more about that discipline. Let me first state something that the majority of our church, the Syriac church, it's now in the diaspora, not in our homeland. And this is, I don't know if we are fortunate or not, but uh, this is what we have. But uh, we don't have any problem, as uh, His Eminence mentioned, uh, we welcome everybody from outside. And usually, uh, all our uh, professors and teachers, they studied abroad. And when, when they are uh, coming back to, to our homeland, they are welcomed. And uh, of course, sometimes we have certain challenges because coming from uh, Italy or America or uh, somewhere with uh, sometimes uh, new uh, ideas, uh, we have this, uh, sometimes it will uh, reach uh, a certain level of fighting between the foreigners and uh, the conservatives. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? So, um, so on the one hand, um, it's very clear that the academic study of theology is not required for every single person. Um, but to some extent, there's, there's at least within, among, among yourselves, um, there's an understanding that maybe it can be helpful, it can be useful, it can be beautiful in, in some way. Um, so then, then where do you think kind of this divide comes from? Because it seems like so many, whether it's a sermon or a lecture or, or whatever it is, um, anytime that uh, church education, so to speak, is brought up, um, it inevitably turns into, it feels like it inevitably turns into um, that we're not Christians yeah. because we've learned, but simply like maybe some sort of um, belief or so I, I guess maybe could you comment on that kind of um, divide? You, you all spoke about like the historical examples of these great academic centers, whether in Armenia or in Syria or in Egypt. Um, but why, why, where do you think that divide actually kind of comes from and, and maybe what's, what's reinforcing it? Or is it just simply some sort of fear, kind of like you mentioned? Uh, I thought I said it in my comments. Uh, number one, um, the, the history of these churches in the East 
is such that the church did not have the luxury to pursue uh, serious academic research. When the Fatimids are killing the Copts and, and destroying their churches and the, and the Arabs and the uh, Mongols are burning the Armenian manuscripts, the, the patriarch or the abbot of the monastery cannot say, let's do Bible study and study why uh, Paul is using the imperfect here and not the simple past. It's not, you know, it's not, <laughs> you can't do that. That's number one. Number two, uh, gradually through the centuries, uh, churches were, I don't want to use a negative, churches were l l overloaded with the responsibility to do other things that were not initially part of the go out, teach them what I've taught you, baptize them. You know, the church in the East especially became more of an ethnic club. Uh, we are Armenians, we're Greeks, we're Syriacs, we're, uh, in fact, that becomes more of a uh, kind of a, uh, essential element of these gatherings than the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thus, serious theology became secondary. Creedal statements, a simple rule of faith, uh, um, memorization of the Lord's Prayer and the Creed became all what the church required from, from the faithful. Beyond that, the church stopped the, the think tank. There was no... Uh, research, there was no need for the research in the church because that's, the church was happy with that. And of course this creates a, creates a schism with uh, kind of the modern post-enlightenment post, uh, Europe uh, scholarship where they, as I said, try to uh, open every, uh, you know, uh, rock and see underneath it and the church w was not capable, was not interested at that stage. I think it's unfortunate the church has to go back to be interested in that. As I said in my conclusion, why not demand that every priest becomes a scholar? Why not? Uh, and other things. Thank you. I don't want to repeat my sermon. But my speech. Not sermon. Um, yeah, I, I think um, to add to, to his eminence that there, there is a necessary time uh, and place for that theological endeavor. And during, during the periods of, of persecution uh, and afterwards, so even in, uh, say, modern, modern day Egypt until most recently, that they were always in an, in a, uh, an environment that the challenges or the, the theological challenges were mainly coming from one side. So historically, when you have the heresies emerging in the third century, fourth century, fifth century, it compelled the church to reflect and to undertake a very serious examination of its Christology, of its Trinitarian theology, of the liturgy. And it was only, I would say, in the modern time, because our church relative to the 1969, 1960s, you start to see the cops immigrating outside of Egypt. And then we are uh, immersed in a very different culture with many questions. So it, it pushed us to make a very quick assessment of and to answer several theological. And that, that's why I think it was so, so uh, important for us to undertake. That's when you started to see this need to study more and, and abroad. Um, so I, I think, and now we have no choice. We have no, no choice in the matter. It, we are compelled uh, to, to do this. Um, uh, Anselm uh, said, uh, you know, to have a faith-seeking understanding. So the belief is essential, but on top of it, the understanding, the, the, the comprehension of what we believe, uh, it's necessary and it's uh, fundamental uh, and it comes later. And I think in our churches, we're at a different stage when that understanding is sought, <laughs> uh, depending on its own history. Uh, we have time for one more question and then They'll hopefully take questions on a personal level. One more question. Um, are there any publications or resources that you might point to for those that are interested in, other than, say, the writings of Sebastian Brock, which were mentioned earlier, but are there any series or um, publication houses or anything, uh, or any just any authors, really, that you'd uh, suggest, other than the fathers, of course? Modern writers. Modern writers. Okay. Modern, are there any um, authors in the Oriental traditions that you would recommend 
um, for modern writings on theological texts? In, in, in Syriac studies, we have many, uh, not only Sebastian Brock, we, we have uh, especially Baumstark in, uh, in, uh, in from, from Germany. He is the father of the liturgical studies and he wrote a very important uh, book about uh, liturgy compare Matthäus, uh, Taft from uh, Notre Dame here in America. You know, uh, I cannot li uh, list all of them, but we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, scholars. They did a lot for uh, the Syriac studies. And now we are, thank God, now we are having few uh, of those scholars from within the church as uh, we have uh, here in New Jersey, George Kiraz and many others. And George Kiraz, he is uh, trying to publish uh, many of our uh, ancient books. And he is, uh, if I can say, the father of the translation of the Peshitta, the simple Syriac translation of the uh, whole Bible, which uh, uh, it's really very old from the second century or end of first century, the Peshitta. George Kiraz is working with other uh, uh, scholars to, to translate it. So thank you. And, and I, th I think for us, uh, we are in the stage of focusing on the primary texts, because many of the, um, at least the, the scholars of Alexander, many of their writings have not been completely translated, available in Arabic and or English. Um, and uh, like Felix Sinus of Mabuk uh, and, and others, like uh, in, in with George Karaz in the Syriac tradition, uh, St. Sir of Alexandria, that's why I focus, <laughs> dedicate uh, years to, it's, it's getting there. But that understanding is, there's still a gap between our clergy and our, um, our uh, congregations uh, exposed to that, those primary texts. Because if we just focus on the secondary, we're gonna be disagreeing from here till, Second coming. So. Let me just quickly mention a few names. Uh, Professor Michael Stone from the Hebrew University, basically biblical texts, Armenian texts of the Bible and Armenian commentaries. Professor Peter Cowie of the uh, US uh, California University of Los Angeles. He's basically the expert in the New Testament and the text of the New Testament. Uh, Professor James Russell of the older religions of Armenia before Christianity. Uh, Gabriela Winkler and Professor Taft, Armenian liturgy. So there's a lot of Father Daniel Findikian, Armenian uh, liturgy. Uh, we have a list of scholars, thank God, in the previous few decades who have dedicated their research. On the, well, we have a series of publications. It's called The Bible in the Oriental Orthodox Tradition that's published by Peter Lang, of which we have about six, seven volumes, which discusses the Bible in the Oriental Orthodox traditions. Uh, that's new, it's been about five, six, four, five years now. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you again to Fordham University and the Orthodox Christian Study Center and um, your graces, your eminence for, for coming out of country, out of town and out of state um, for this special evening. And I thank you all for coming um, on, on a weekday evening um, and attending um, here at the Bronx. Um, again, I encourage you to follow um, the Orthodox Christian Center um, on Twitter and on Facebook um, and sign up uh, your email for further events like this um, on their newsletter on the website. Um, again, if there's any further questions, hopefully um, His Eminence and the, His Graces will be around for a short time um, and we'll be here to um, discuss further events. Anything you wanted to add? Okay, okay. Um, everyone, thank you for attending. Do you want to say